Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is Michael Schreier, partner in Hush Blackwell's Government Contracts and Labor and Employment Groups. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console, there are multiple application icons for your use during the program today. If you have any questions, specifically for any of the presenters during the webcast, please use the Q&A icon to submit. If you'd like to share experience with, with everyone, please use the attendee chat icon during the webcast. We will try to answer all questions during the webcast today, but if a fuller answer is needed, or when, not if, when we run out of time, it will be answered as appropriate later via email. A PDF of, of today's presentation is available in the resources folder. This program is pending approval for CLE hours. To report your hours, click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. A certificate of attendance, including course numbers, will be emailed to you tomorrow, along with a recording of the webcast for watching and sharing. Toward the end of the program, be sure to complete our short survey. We use your feedback to plan future programs and that are applicable to your business needs. That is all for the housekeeping items. Let's get on with the show. Uh, I'm your host for today. I've been practicing here in the Washington DC area for almost 30 years in labor and employment and government contracts law and particularly the intersection of those two very different areas of law. I'm also the current co-chair of the ABA Public Contract Law Section's Employment Safety and Labor Committee, one of the ABA committees with primary jurisdiction over all this federal contractor COVID stuff. Joining me today are my colleagues, Brian Hendricks and Rufino Gaitan. Brian advises clients on environmental health and safety law with a focus on litigation, incident investigations, enforcement defense, and regulatory compliance counseling. Bryant will be addressing the impact of the new OSHA ETS that came out yesterday on the federal contractor guidance, as well as some record keeping best practices. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those in different time zones. Rufino has dedicated his career to helping employers map out optimal paths to resolve staffing and compliance issues with high stakes outcomes. Rufino will be talking about how to handle the process how to handle and process employee requests for religious and disability accommodations and other pure employment issues. Before we get started, just want to let you all know, we could easily spend two to three hours talking about all the ins and outs of the federal contractor COVID mandate, and even longer talking about the OSHA ETS that came out yesterday, but we won't do that to you today. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide you with a broad overview of the issues involved in the federal contractor COVID mandate arm you to identify and get in front of those issues, hopefully before they, they have a chance to become problems. So let's get on to what y'all came here for today. So federal contractor COVID mandate stems from the executive order that was issued several months ago, executive order 14042. And uh, in order to better understand it, um, you have to sort of get, get to the original definitions. First, it applies to any new contract or contract-like instrument, new solicitation, extension or renewal of existing contract and exercises of options. Uh, so it, basically there has to be a new contractual relationship because as all federal contractors know, you have to comply with the contract clauses. And so there has to be a mechanism for the government to insert clauses into your contracts. But what's interesting about this definition is, is the phrase contract or contract-like instrument. Now, you know, folks like me who've been practicing in, in the area of labor and employment have seen this, uh, this, this weird definition pop up before. Uh, it, it's currently used in the Department of Labor's regulations uh, for paid federal contractor paid sick leave and federal contractor minimum wage requirements. And it's basically designed to expand the scope of what a contract could be. Uh, to include all kinds of things. Uh, specifically, it's designed to expand it to procurement, all, all, all kinds of procurement actions, lease agreements, cooperative agreements, intergovernmental services agreements, licenses, permits, and any other type of agreement, regardless of nomenclature, their language, not mine. And so expect this to be very broadly pushed out. Um, and there, it's very possible they may push the envelope of what constitutes a contract or a contract-like instrument. So keep your eyes open if you have any kind of relationship with the federal government. Okay, going back to the slide here. 
Um, not only this, there are four basic instances where the clause will come into play. Number one, a procurement contract for services, construction, or a leasehold interest in real property. So again, as defined here, it's typically not supposed to apply to contracts purely for products, pure supply contracts. But it does cover you know, mixed services and, and, and supply contracts and also you know, leases. Um, that, that's an interesting way of sort of getting, getting at the, to, a way to expand the coverage. Michael, how about yeah. grants? We have a question about grants, that's funding from story. grants. We'll, we'll get to that in just a second, absolutely. Perfect. And so, but going, going through what is covered, then I'll, I'll talk about what isn't covered. What is covered, again, any, any kind of contracts covered by the Service Contract Act, which makes sense. If you have service employees doing service work for the government, then that, that's where the, how the government wants to have this covered. Concession agreements, concession contracts, you know, think, you know, providing uh, dining facilities or hotel facilities at the national parks. That's sort of the, sort of the quintessential example. And then the last one is sort of a catch-all, um, usually used for, for situations like having an on-site daycare center at a federal building. All right. To the question about exclusions, grants, absolutely. Grants are not covered under the executive order, uh, as well as all these other types of things. But the important points for this, for today's discussion, uh, grants are excluded, uh, contracts and subcontracts whose value is less than the simplified acquisition threshold, which is currently set at $250,000, are not supposed to be covered. And finally, subcontracts solely for the provision of products. And again, this is all just a direct quote from the executive order. So if it's, keep these concepts in mind as, as we go forward here today. So as with any kind of uh, federal procurement issue, you start off with the executive order, and, but that, that just sets the policy. The question is, what's the contract clause? Well, here's the contract clause. Um, and I have this slide here so you can take it home and, and uh, click on the links and look at it uh, later at your convenience. But basically, there, there are two prototypes, and they're almost essentially word for word identical. You have the FAR deviation clause, and you also have the DFARS deviation clause. And I'll get to the language on it, on it later. But the important point for now is that those are sort of the standard clauses. And yet, to make life even more confusing, all these agencies you see listed here have created their own deviation clauses to use with their own contracts and contract-like instruments. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to go through every single one of them yet. Uh, I believe most of them are more or less word for word identical. Uh, but, uh, you know, be careful and read them carefully uh, to make sure there aren't any you know, crazy changes. Uh, quick question from the comments, as, as I can chew gum and walk at the same time here. Uh, could a construction project be considered, be considered a product? No. Uh, it would be kind of fact specific, but chances are most likely it will be considered a service, particularly uh, the definition calls for procurement for services, including construction. Uh, service and construction is typically considered a service, particularly uh, in light of the fact that uh, the government's considering the Davis-Bacon Act, uh, which covers prevailing wages for contracts for construction, which involves employees. So that's why they, they typically think of construction as a service for purposes of, of this regulation. Okay, so we're gonna look, gonna look at the clauses. So, Here's, here's, here's how the clause looks. Uh, I took out the definitions of legal authority because that's just a lot of stuff for the lawyers to get all excited about. Uh, the definitions just pretty much defines what the United States is and its territories and where the thing will, where the clause will, will be covered. The legal authority talks about uh, the, the president's statutory authority to regulate federal procurement and the executive order. But the two clauses, two parts of the clause that are really important here are parts C and D which I've quoted here in, in their entirety. And this is it. And the contractor shall comply with all guidance, including guidance conveyed through the frequently asked questions as amended during the performance of this contract for contractor or subcontractor workplace locations published by the Safer Federal Workforce Task Force. 
that's the full extent of the uh, of the contract clause. Um, then you know, subsection D talks about the flow down, um, but basically the you know all of what we're going to talk about here is is the guidance that's referenced here in section C, because in effect this contract clause is somewhat of a placeholder. It says, okay, yeah, you're you're, you're required to comply to the stuff over there. Uh, to go look at, at, at this guidance that's going to be ever changing. Now, one thing to keep in mind, I've been talking to lots of clients and lots of colleagues across the country over the last couple of weeks as this has been rolling out. Um, agencies, federal agencies have been all over the map as to how zealous they are in rolling out these clauses. Uh, some agencies are trying to be cooperative with their contractors. Some are trying to ram these clauses down contractors' throats in less than cooperative manner. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, the same agencies that are having issues with uh, being playing nice in the sandbox and cooperating with, with contractors are also tending to try to expand the use of these clauses beyond just services. And they're trying to push them down into uh, some product contracts and some other things which are not purely service contracts. So one thing to keep in mind as we go forward here. So let's talk about the guidance. All right. So again, the, the contract clause points to the guidance. The guidance can be found here. Again, this is a take home dip in water. It becomes a full fledged uh, uh, piece of analysis for you to use back at your office. But uh, you have the original guidance document which was published back in September, and you have the task force's webpage FAQ section, which changes almost every other day. Uh, at this point, uh, it, it's, I would recommend that you all consult it at least twice a week, if not more frequently, because it does change rapidly. Uh, the last change that I saw was November 1st, which was Monday. I would fully expect, based on stuff I'm gonna talk about in a couple minutes, that there could be new amendments, new changes to it today. All of these changes, however, all this updated guidance will be, um, you know, incorporated by the contract clause. So you have to comply with all of it. So it's a little bit of a moving target and you have to stay on top of this. So again, more lawyer stuff, but these, these are the important definitions to consider when, when looking at the guidance and the, and the, I look at this as the who and the where. Covered employees is the who, covered contractor workplace is the where. And so the definitions here are important because the guidance only applies to covered contractor employees, which includes and means any full-time or part-time employee of a covered contractor working on or in connection with a covered contract or working at a covered contractor workplace, okay? We'll dissect that in a second. And then this includes employees of covered contractors who are not themselves working on or in connection with a covered contract. I, my own editorial, this makes this last sentence makes no sense. Don't know how you can de, you know, basically define something outside of the, of the original definition to include it, but we'll get to that in a second. Michael, how, so, about, how about support employees in marketing or uh, uh, other areas, legal, that kind of thing, that they are all considered covered employees, right? They are, and I was just about to get to that, exactly. Um, because the, the definition talks about on or in connection with a, a covered contract. Those folks who are working on a covered contract, very simple. Those are the people who, you know, at a call center, those people who are manning the call center. Um, you talk about a construction site, those are the people working at the construction site, actually performing the work under the contract. The in connection with is a little more squishy, and you can quote me on that as, as a legal term. Um, in connection with, according to the guidance, has been defined to be HR, audit, legal. Uh, generally think of it as any kind of HQ or uh, overhead costs associated with, uh, overhead individuals associated with performing the contract itself. Those are the individuals who would be on or in connection with. And uh, you have to you know, carefully a analyze what your workforce is and who you have and what, what they're doing in order to determine uh, who would be in connection with. And this is where I've been getting a lot of calls from clients to kind of parse through how far down uh, the org chart 
somebody would have to be to be in connection with the federal contract to be covered. So great question, Brian. Um, then the other definition we have to talk about here is the covered contractor workplace. And it's defined to mean a location controlled by a covered contractor at which any employee of a covered contractor working on or in connection with a covered contract is likely to be present during the performance of a covered contract. Fortunately, it goes on to say that a covered contractor workplace does not include a covered contractor employee's residence. So to the extent you have people working remotely, the where does not include people's individual homes. At least, at least the guidance had enough uh, common sense to exclude people's homes from, from some of the requirements. But again, it, it's a very broad definition here, um, designed to include any place where people working on or in connection with the contract are likely to be performing that work during the course of the contract. So putting those uh, definitions in your back pocket, and we'll come back to those later because they keep coming up. There are three requirements as part of the guidance. There's a vaccination, there's a masking and social distancing, and there's a designation of a responsible individual. And we'll get to all three of those. Let's talk about first about the vaccination requirements. Again, this is ripped right from the headlines. Uh, right from the, 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 the plain language of the guidance, uh, covered contractors must ensure that all covered contractor employees are fully vaccinated unless the employee is legally entitled to an accommodation. And we'll pick all this apart in a second. The important point here is covered contract employees must be fully vaccinated no later than December 8, 2021. Well, that was true until about 24 hours ago. Uh, and you can tell, you know, trying to try and change slides even on this fly here, we didn't, we're not able to fully update that. At a press conference yesterday, or in the White House uh, press notes, uh, indicated that the, the administration is going to harmonize the compliance dates for the federal contractor mandate, OSHA ETS, and other existing COVID requirements issued by the federal government to harmonize them all to be January 4th, 2022. Haven't seen that show up yet in the guidance or on the, the government contractor webpage, but I fully expect that by the time we're done with this presentation here today, it'll probably be amended and probably be up there. But you know, keep in, keep in mind that while originally called for December 8th compliance, it's probably now January 4, 2022. So notice in here that this does not say you have to fire employees if they're not compliant. It just simply says that all employees working on the contract or in connection with the contract have to be vaccinated. And so it's leaving it to the employers and government contractors to figure out how to deal with their workforces uh, to ensure that those, only those people who are vaccinated work on the federal contract. And we'll talk about that a little more coming up. Now, the important point that Rufina will, will talk about a little later is about the religious and medical accommodation. And this, in the guidance itself, it provides for religious and medical accommodations from the masking as well as the vaccination requirements. Um, it does not permit any other types of, of accommodation, just religious medical slash disability. Uh, are boosters required? Oh, that's a great question. Um, currently, no. Um, but again, the... Uh, the guidance is ever changing. And so today what is fully vaccinated is, you know, somebody who has completed two courses of Pfizer or, or, or Moderna or one course of the J and J. Um, but I could easily envision in the future that the task force will change the guidance, update the guidance to suggest some other higher standard. So yes, today the standard is just two shots of Pfizer or Moderna, but it's possible that it may later include boosters. So stay tuned. All right, proof of the vaccination. Uh, I, I like to sort of consider, compare this to an employer's I-9 immigration obligations. Basically, you know, as, a, as, a, as an employer, you have an obligation to review I-9 documentation to ensure that the individuals you're hiring are authorized to work in the United States. Same thing here with the COVID requirement. Um, it, 
the, the guidance requires employers to gather information from their employees uh, to, to, to have the employees verify their vaccination status. And the employees are required to produce one of the following forms of documentation or, or proof, uh, and only these forms. Uh, they're not allowed to pr produce antibody tests or anything else, just these four types of, of, of documentary proof. It can be a hard copy, it can be digital, but only either one of the official COVID cards or record of immunization and other you know, official documents <coughs> are permitted. Uh, currently, there's no requirement that employers have to make copies or, or keep copies of the proof. Um, there's no record re keeping requirement, as Brian will probably talk about as, as far as the OSHA ETS, but it may be prudent to do so. And we can talk a little later about uh, how the, one can keep and maintain those records in a way that uh, you know, complies with HIPAA and other, uh, other obligations that you all may have as employers. All right. Masking distancing. This is the second part of the three parts of the, of the, of the guidance. Um, again, uh, for those folks here in the DC area, this, this isn't too much of a stretch. We've, most of the counties around here sort of require this already. Um, but all covered contractor employees and visitors at covered contractor workplaces must comply with CDC guidance for masking and distancing. And uh, again, it comes back to the definition of a covered contractor workplace. It's any place where it's, it's likely that people working on or in connection with the federal contract will be located. Um, next, you have to, there's a requirement that, let me back up for a second. The masking and social distancing requirement is flexible. It's not set in time. It's actually key to the level of transmission in the county in which your facilities are located. And the guidance directs individuals to actually look at the CDC's COVID-19 data tracker county view on at least a weekly basis to determine what the level of transmission is in your county. If we're talking, uh, if, if it's at high or, or substantial levels, then there's certain masking uh, obligations for all individuals indoors. If it dips down to uh, moderate or low, uh, then the indoor masking requirements for vaccinated individuals uh, can go by the wayside while, while, you're, while the county's at that lower level. Now, the masking requirements and social distancing requirements to, uh, apply to all indoor and to certain outdoor settings. It applies, you know, indoors, you know, for, for obvious reasons, but certain outdoors, you know, typically, you know, large group gatherings, uh, crowded settings, and other places where there's, you know, a heightened risk of transmission. And um, it also requires, the masking and distancing requires you to post signage at the entrances and authorize you to require all visitors to follow masking and physical distancing protocols for not fully vaccinated individuals. In other words, you can presume that all visitors are not vaccinated and require them to mask as would any non-vaccinated individual. Ah, how are we supposed to know who is vaccinated and not vaccinated when they come in our space for masking and physical distancing purposes? Well, to the extent we're talking about uh, visitors, yeah, that, that, that becomes an interesting question. You know, what, what's your policy is? Do you require visitors to provide proof of vaccination upon entrance? Uh, I know that uh, our firm, uh, at, least at, at, at least at our DC office, we tend to require that some kind of proof of vaccination before folks can come enter our space. Uh, that is somewhat, somewhat in accordance with how the federal government is working uh, in, in some of their offices here in the DC area as well. So that's, you can always ask for the proof of vaccination. Whether they provide it to you or not, that's another story. And if they don't, then you should presume that they are not vaccinated and ask them to mask while on site. Okay, more masking and distancing. Obviously, there's there's room for exceptions. Um, but the, the basic takeaway from all this is that obviously you can't wear a mask while you're eating. You have to be kind of you know, have some common sense about this. Um, but at the same time. You know, it's not up to individual employees to exercise their own discretion as to when they can unmask. It is left to best left to the safety officer or the designated person, uh, who we're going to talk about in a couple seconds, as to whether or not uh, certain 
activities should be exempted from the masking requirements indoors or outdoors. Right, Michael, so how with... about local masking bans or requirements? This supersedes all of those, correct? It probably does, um, but again, that's going to be an untested issue. As in the guidance itself, it calls out that the that this federal contractor mandate is issued pursuant to federal authority. Um, but these are not government regulations. Uh, this is guidance, and these are contract clauses. So normal concepts of preemption and, and federal supremacy are sort of at the fringes here. Um, it's likely that a court would, uh, would, would deem these clauses to have precedence over a state ordinance. But to my knowledge, this hasn't been tested yet. So we're heading into a little bit of a gray area, uh, particularly for folks in, in states which do have bans on masks and do have bans on some of, this, some of these activities that are in conflict with the federal guidance. Thank you. So again, designated person requirement. Uh, there are, the, the guidance requires you to, to designate somebody, you know, like a safety officer or something like that, uh, to coordinate uh, your company's response and to coordinate your company's uh, communication activities, uh, particularly at the second bullet point, you know, the, the designated person is responsible for communicating with the workplace in an understandable manner you know, through, through memoranda, flyers, posters, emails, typical communication to advise employees on a regular basis as to what's going on and what their COVID requirements are. Um, the designated person is also responsible for ensuring that employees provide uh, the, the documentation for proof of vaccination and also to communicate to visitors that they have to comply with masking. Basically, the, the guidance requires contractors to designate a key, at least one point person who's responsible, ultimately responsible for all these requirements. Whether you, you know, sub-delegate or have you know, uh, you know, people reporting to the person with ultimate authority, that's going to depend on the size and composition of your workforce and where your facilities are located and how your facilities are located. But basically, you have to have at least one person in order to be in compliance with the regulations. So yes, getting back to the preemption issue, and we, we just talked about that. Um, so we can move right along. So let's talk about uh, putting aside the, the employment issues, and let's talk about the more pure government contractor issues. Um, you know, because these are, because we, the contract clauses are involved here. Um, the question is, how do the clauses get in your contract? Now, it's pretty easy for any new federal contracts. The contracting officers are supposed to put the clauses in, and you have advance notice as you're bidding on the contract that the new COVID clauses are going to be there, and you factor that in. And you can then decide whether it's worth bidding on the contract or not. The rub comes when, it, when the contracting officer tries to modify an existing contract you may have to you know, include the clause going forward on an existing contract. Typically, that's supposed to be done through a bilateral contract modification. One uh, agencies could do a unilateral modification. But that's something they only use that for things that are purely administrative in nature. But there's nothing administrative in nature about these COVID requirements. So agencies are required to do a bilateral contract modification, which means you need to sign off on it. And they just can't you know, order you to sign off on it. Um, now, as I hinted at before, there are uh, lots of federal, federal agencies have their own personalities, and that comes through in their contracting officers. Some contracting officers are negotiating with prime contractors as to how and where to, to put the clauses in, how to phase them in over time, and to work with contractors about uh, you know, taking other steps to slowly ramp up compliance issues. Other agencies are sort of taking a, you know, a take it or leave it approach and ramming it down uh, contractors' throats. And I've seen a whole, whole variety of approaches. Uh, anecdotally, I've heard that some of the DOD agencies are being much more uh, upfront and more cooperative about this. And some of the other agencies, uh, without throwing anybody, uh, anybody under the bus, for instance, say the VA, have taken a less enlightened approach. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that while the government has uh, a lot of leverage here, ultimately the government does not want to lose lots of contractors over this. And part of the 
plan of pushing this out to federal contractors is to rely on the overall culture of compliance by federal contractors to spread this. And, and the administration is hoping that most federal contractors don't push back. Uh, so and some, some contracting officers have got the memo, some didn't. Um, but joking aside, there is no uniform guidance to contracting officers right now as to how they're supposed to roll this out and how they're supposed to interact with, uh, with contractors about doing the modifications. And so each agency's culture is sort of coming through here. But the important thing here is that you should be willing to negotiate with contracting officers uh, about timing, about coverage, um, and whether it even applies in the first place. Uh, I've had you know, calls from several, uh, several clients over the last couple of weeks where they produce uh, airplane parts or electronic components or other things like that. And they say, well, well why, is the H why is the agency pushing down these clauses on us? Good question, because you know, as we read before, it's only supposed to apply to service contracts. But if you're making airplane parts and electronic components, those aren't services, those are products. So be, don't be shy about being willing to, in, in a very principled and diplomatic sort of way, pushing back against the agencies and say, hey guys, you know, I understand you wanna be a little overzealous about this, but take a step back, read the executive order, read the language of the clauses, it doesn't really apply here. Another example of uh, where my government contracts at, beware of waiver clauses. Um, because this, you know, particularly in the con context of a bilateral contract modification or a uh, extension, uh, I've seen some agencies, again, the VA, trying to push uh, very one-sided waiver clauses along with the FAR clause. Uh, basically asking contractors to waive any and all claims they may have for additional compensation, uh, for requests for equitable adjustment as a result of compliance with the COVID requirements uh, in exchange for signing off on the contract mod. And some agencies, again, the VA, have been very insistent that, they, that, that, that contractors must do this or else they will be t default terminated. Um, again, that's not cool. Um, because again, at this time, we don't know exactly what your costs will be for compliance, what, what exactly, whether you have any compensable costs that you could submit. Um, the government, of course, doesn't think that this is going to be, uh, it doesn't think you're gonna have any additional costs, but I could off the top of my head think, you know, that you may have uh, various personnel costs, especially if you have mass terminations or mass resignations you may have other you know, legitimate costs that you could uh, seek reimbursement for. So uh, the important point of all this is, you know, be, be careful about any kind of waiver clauses, try to negotiate them away, try to educate the contracting officers and tell them that you, they don't need to do this. Um, but also um, at the same time, keep good accounting records of any costs you believe may be associated with compliance with this clause and keep them according to good ca cost accounting standards uh, so that, you know, if the opportunity arises, uh, you could present a timely request for adjustment. Um, but if you don't capture the information and don't capture the cost, you certainly won't be able to. All right. So I, I mentioned this before, um, the guidance is ever changing. So in a lot of respects, uh, the federal contractor mandate is somewhat of a moving target. And by accepting the contract clause, you're, you're effectively giving the, con the government a blank check to change the, the requirements uh, without adding a new clause uh, to your contract anytime in the future, just by updating the guidance. Um, and so you know, the guidance is not a regulation. There is no notice and comment required. Uh, it gets updated at the drop of a hat. So just be careful about this. And as I mentioned before, but the designated person should review the, the guidance and the task force work page frequently, at least two or three times a week, just to make sure that nothing else has changed and you capture all, 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 the, all the changes that may, have, may result. Now, the, the last little piece here uh, for this moving target is that contractors and, and subcontractors must comply with the guidance and any additional agency workplace safety requirements. So the guidance you know, is contractual, 
um, incorporated through the FAR clause. But each agency may have its own regulations and requirements for on-site work at federal at agency facilities. So you're going to want to you know, make sure you, you you stay on top of that as well, uh, and to work with the contracting officer uh, for each for each agency which you do business to make sure that you can stay up to date on what specific what site specific requirements may be for masking, for vaccinations, because um, some some agencies may prohibit unvaccinated people from even being on site depending on, on the nature of the work. And it may require you to have further communications with the agency as to which one, which of your employees are vaccinated or not vaccinated. So just keep that in mind. Again, each, each situation is a little different and we're gonna have to take them all one by one here. And I love the questions. I'll get to some of them in a bit, but uh, got a little more information to plow through, but I will get to some of your questions today because they're all great ones as I keep seeing them here in the chat pop up. All right. So let's move along. Flow downs. Yeah, up till now, I've been primarily talking about if you have a prime contract with the federal government. And this is sort of the pivot point. Uh, if you're a prime contractor and you have the FAR clause, again, we talked about subsection D of the FAR clause, and it talks about the flow downs. And any federal contractor knows about flow down clauses. And here it says that, the con that this clause must be flowed down in all subcontracts. Uh, that exceed the simplified acquisition threshold and are for services, including construction, performed within the United States or its outlying areas. So again, um, if you have subcontracts for product, you know, supply contracts, you know, for pencils, paper clips, whatever, then theoretically the clause should not be flowed down. But if you have you know, uh, you know, service contractors, uh, subcontractors performing work for you, and they and the value of the subcontract exceeds two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, then you need to amend your subcontract to add the clause to your subcontractor. And uh, so that's that's if you're the prime. If you're the sub, uh, I've seen a whole bunch of other issues that have come up in this regard, uh, because some large federal co prime contractors have already sent out notices to every single one of their subcontractors, whether they be for services or supplies, and have told all of their subcontractors, gee, we're gonna flow down this clause to you. Well, not so fast. Uh, if you're a subcontractor and your, your prime and your, your customer tries to flow this clause down to you, and all you do is provide paper clips, pencils, you know, supplies, uh, again, I, I wouldn't be shy about reaching out to the contracting officer for the customer and saying, hey, look, you know, I understand what you're trying to do here, but the clause says you only have to apply it to service providers. We don't provide services. Please don't uh, put the clause because it doesn't apply to us. And so even if you're a subcontractor, if the, if the clause gets inserted, you still have some of the same release and cost issues that I talked about earlier. You, you, again, you want to make sure that as a subcontractor, you try not to you know, sign off on any release uh, for any claims that may result uh, as a result of uh, compliance with the clause. Similarly, you're going to want to keep really good financial records, and cost accounting data, uh, in case you're able to submit a request for adjustment that the, that the prime would then have to float up to the government for reimbursement. All right. In the home stretch here, folks. Um, Basically, as I said before, the guidance is changing all the time. And here are just some of the questions that just came out on, on, uh, on Monday of this week. And I'll go through them very quickly because each one could, could be another 20 minutes in and of itself. But you know, what steps should a covered contractor take if a covered contractor employee refuses to be vaccinated? Well, the guidance on the, on the task force's webpage is a little squishy. Um, basically, it says, gee, you should counsel them, you should uh, ed educate them, and use progressive discipline like we do here at the federal government. And they say re removal occurs only after continued noncompliance. Again, it's, it's going to vary based on, on your workforce. It's going to vary based on the response you get from certain employees. But you know, if you have an employee that absolutely ap positively refuses to comply and says, over my dead body, you know, again, that, that's that's going to be a very fact specific inquiry to deal with the situation, the type of employee, the type of work setting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that, that's going to be discussion on, on an individualized basis, unfortunately. 
uh, between you and whatever legal counsel of your of your choosing, hopefully us. Um, next, you know, what happens if, uh, if a covered contractor does not comply? Well, here the guidance was very clear. If a covered contractor is not taking steps to comply, significant actions such as termination of the contract should be taken. Well, basically, if, if, you, if you thumb your nose at the federal government and say, you can't make me, I won't do this, then the government has the right to terminate. Um, alternatively, if you are working in good faith to try to figure out how to make it work and working with the contracting officer, uh, my sense in talking with, uh, with my colleagues here in D.C. and elsewhere is that uh, the government is, is, is going to want to work with you. Um, the quote from about two weeks ago was that the old deadline, December 8th, was not a cliff. It was just an inflection point, at which point a contracting officer is going to work with folks to try to get them in compliance. So, yeah. let's see. Uh, next one. Do all requests for accommodation need to be resolved by, the, by January 4th? No, they don't. Um, again, it, it's, it's a question of good faith. Are, are the individuals working with you? And we can talk about more that, about that a little later. But basically, as long as the employee is engaging in the, in the accommodation process, uh, no, you don't have to be firing anybody. Uh, you just have to make sure that they follow appropriate safety, safety protocols for non-vaccinated individuals uh, while, while you're hashing out the accommodation issues. Let's see what else. We'll skip one of these things here. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll skip to the last one um, in the interest of time. All right, this is where things got a little interesting on Monday. We'll talk about you know, basically affiliated workplaces. And, and if, say, for instance, um, you know, contractor A is performing work in a building uh, owned and operated by an affiliate. Uh, would the entire building be covered? Would, would the affiliate be covered? And you know, basically borrowing from the Small Business Administration's rules on affiliation uh, for, for 8A, for uh, service disabled veterans, all of those concepts. Uh, and the short answer is yes, affiliates are covered as, as contractors and as contractor workplaces for purposes of workplace COVID requirements. So that's an important distinction that was just added to the guidance this week. Uh, so please do pay attention to that uh, going forward. And that's gonna obviously be the, the subject of a lot of analysis and uh, discussion going forward. But this is one of those issues that definitely want you to be aware of. Okay. What, and everybody always asks me, what's the consequence for noncompliance? Well, as I indicated before, you know, they could terminate your contract if you, re if you refuse to sign. They can. Some, probably, some agencies probably will. Um, but I, I'm betting that a lot of agencies, depending on what you do for them, may have a lot more flexibility than they're letting on right now. Um, but the, the, so but that, that, that's a question purely in, in your control. The, the, the more concerning potential problem, and one that may not be within, fully within your control, is the second bullet point here, potential key TAM and false claims actions. Um, as you, just to give a quick primer, you know, False Claims Act, if, if one submits a, a false or fraudulent claim to the government and gets paid on it, uh, that, that's a violation of the False Claims Act, and the government can sue you for triple damages and seek debarment and other nasty penalties. And so one of the concerns that I've been advising clients on in the last couple of weeks is that when you submit your payment vouchers, payment applications, invoices, uh, after you've signed off on the COVID clause, you may want to put a disclaimer in your invoicing to the government. And I'm, this is just you know, off the top of my head, don't quote this, we can work on specific language, but something along the lines, you know, that you're submitting the invoice and then a little footnote at the bottom, something like that saying, you know, we're working in good faith towards compliance with the COVID clause, but not but compliance is not yet achieved. Because you don't want some enterprising government, uh, government prosecutor uh, attorney general, uh, inspector general type saying, gee, you submitted these invoices for payment. You, it, we, we construe it to be an implied certification that you complied with the COVID mandates and complied with guidance and you didn't. Therefore, that's fraud on the United States government. We want our money back. So again, this is one of those lawyers 
you know, nightmares, you know, angels dancing on the head of a pin, but at the same time, it's probably not a bad idea to put some kind of disclaimer in your invoices for the time being, at least, um, explaining, you know, if, if you are not fully in compliance, making that clear so that the government could then not rely on the fact that you're, you're impliedly certifying that you complied. Also, um, you know, False Claims Act claims are based on a, on, a, on a concept of willfulness or bad conduct. And as long as you're showing that you're making good faith efforts towards compliance, that's going to severely undercut any possibility for, for a False Claims Act. All right, last slide for me for now. I saw it in the chat popping up earlier. What about all the lawsuits floating around? Uh, yes. Uh, in the last uh, week and a half, there have been a whole bunch of lawsuits. Um, the two that I have listed here, plus more recent ones by, by, by a bunch of other states, uh, challenging the federal contractor COVID mandate. I haven't seen any uh, litigation filed by companies. That doesn't mean there aren't any, but I haven't, they haven't hit, hit my inbox. But basically, it's been states who've been challenging this. Um, uh, the law, according to Schreier here, is uh, you know, unless they're unless these folks are a lot smarter than me, which is very possible, um, I wouldn't hold my breath that these lawsuits are going to be entirely successful. Um, they might be, um, but uh, you know, it, it's I, I would I would strongly recommend that everybody continue to comply uh, with the federal contractor COVID mandates un unless and until they are struck down by a court because merely the fact that somebody has filed a lawsuit doesn't, doesn't uh, relieve you of your obligation to apply for now. So with that, I turn over control to my colleague, Rufino, to talk to a little bit about accommodation issues. Thanks, Michael. I uh, appreciate it. Um, and, and I know there's been a lot of questions in the uh, in the chat uh, about accommodation issues and I want to just let everybody know we will be publishing um, sort of a, a, a funny you should ask it's one of our series here at Hush Blackwell uh, that addresses a lot of those accommodation questions but what I'd like to do today is just kind of go over a very brief overview of what that process is like uh, I think a lot of you on online here today with us probably are familiar with the standard for the ADA the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, an employer is required under that law to uh, grant reasonable accommodations. An accommodation is really only reasonable if uh, it does not impose an undue hardship on the employer in some fashion. Um, one of the uh, considerations for uh, disability or medical objections for the vaccine uh, that has, I think, tripped up some employers is really, you know, what do you do about employees who are pregnant and who are seeking um, an accommodation simply because they are pregnant. Uh, the CDC, as I think everybody is familiar, has recommended that pregnant uh, uh, employees get uh, vaccinated nonetheless. Uh, but even with that recommendation, you still have individuals who uh, have concerns about um, receiving the vaccine. And so one of the questions is, what do you do about those employees? According to the EEOC, you you if you're granting certain accommodations for other types of, of disabilities um, or, or even for religious accommodations, you should make those same accommodations available or offer them to a pregnant employee. Uh, that from, from just a very practical standpoint, obviously will help you avoid uh, pregnancy discrimination claims, those sorts of things. Uh, from the uh, religious objectors point of view, uh, you know, this requirement to provide accommodations falls under Title VII. Uh, it's the same sort of process. You have to grant uh, as the employer a reasonable accommodation for an employee sincerely held uh, religious belief. Uh, the, the difference here, of course, is that the undue hardship component is significantly different under Title VII. Under the ADA, uh, you know, there, there's uh, employers have to be much more accommodating to employees with disabilities than they have to be for religious um, uh, beliefs. So the threshold is much lower. You have more discretion as an employer to grant or deny a religious objection. The um, 
under the ADA, for example, the, the burden is, you know, if it causes significant difficulty or expense, whereas under uh, Title VII, it's, you know, if it's more than a de minimis effect or cost on the employer, uh, it's no longer reasonable and you can deny that uh, requested accommodation. Uh, there were also some questions in the chat about, um, you know, personal conscientious, uh, you know, objections that aren't necessarily rooted in, um, not necessarily rooted in the uh, uh, employee's religious belief or practices. And so on that front, you know, th there is no exception uh, for these types of uh, uh, objections, at least under the federal contractor requirements. The only exceptions recognized are for medical uh, objections or disabilities and, and for religious objections. So an employee who might be relying on a state specific law um, to claim that they have a right to object to a vaccination, but not because of religion or not because of a medical condition, generally speaking, the federal contractor guidance is gonna trump that and, and the employer is not required to go through that accommodation analysis. Uh, political objections, same issue. Uh, the guidance does not allow for accommodations based on these types of objections. And so if you have somebody who just thinks, you know, I have a right as an American citizen to not put this in my body, but they don't base it on a religion or a medical issue, it's the same, same type of result. It's not required uh, to accommodate. And, and again, the guidance does not allow for those types of accommodations. Uh, and then finally, the other uh, type of accommodation that we've been seeing or request that we've been seeing a lot is from individuals who have previously been infected with the coronavirus, have had COVID-19, and are saying, I'm now naturally immune um, to, um, you know, to the, the virus, and so I don't need and I don't want to get the vaccine. Again, the guidance does not recognize this as a valid objection, so unless the employee has um, a um, medical condition or uh, some religious objection, um, you know, this is not a process that the employer needs to go down for federal contracting purposes. And then in terms of, uh, you know, assessing accommodation requests, I think the, the biggest and probably most important step that you can take as an employer when you receive one of these requests, regardless of whether it's for a disability or medical condition uh, or a religious objection, is to just kind of pause, take a deep breath, and kind of uh, fall back to the basics, right? None of these, none of these requirements, the federal contractor requirement, the uh, OSHA ETS, the CMS uh, rules, none of them have changed the standard analysis for assessing these requests. With, with uh, a medical condition, for example, the typical process, you know, you have to get in, into the interactive process with the employee, you want to address that individual's concerns to the extent that you need medical information. You as the employer have a right to request that information from a healthcare provider. You follow that typical process and ultimately you have to then land on whether the accommodation that's being requested is reasonable. As Michael mentioned earlier, there will be likely some federal agencies that say we cannot accept any sort of a risk and everybody has to be vaccinated at this particular facility. Maybe it's a, a you know a, 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 a VA hospital, for example. Um, and so, if that's a decision coming down from the agency, even though you might be willing as the employer to grant an exemption based on a disability, well, that employee is not going to be able to provide services at that facility anyway. So that's something that you'll have to consider as well. Uh, you know, whether your contracting agency is essentially pushing down a hard mandate that doesn't really accommodate anything else. Um, and then for religious accommodation requests, you don't have as much leeway as you would with a medical uh, request, but you still have the ability to request additional information from the employee. At the outset, you certainly want to understand what the employee's objection is, what the practice at issue from a religious perspective is that they um, that doesn't permit them to be vaccinated. Um, and, and then you want to assess that information. But if you have some objective basis, maybe it's that the employee posted a Facebook post um, saying, you know, I'm just going to claim an, a religious objection, but I don't really believe that to be an issue. That gives you, you know, some uh, objective basis to question the sincerity of the belief. But again, because on the 
religion side, you have much more leeway. It's probably more useful for you as the employer to focus on whether the accommodation is reasonable. And if it creates more than a de minimis effect or, or cost on your organization, then you can probably use that as the basis to deny a requested accommodation. For example, the general, the average cost of uh, a hospital stay for an unvaccinated uh, individual who uh, has COVID-19 is approximately $50,000. I think most courts would agree that if your health plan is having to shell out that kind of money, that is more than a de minimis cost and likely justifies requiring vaccination except in very limited circumstances. Um, so again, you just have to kind of think back to the basics, follow the typical process that you would under any other circumstance, and then ultimately uh, you know, make a decision about how you wanna enforce your requirements and whether you want to take any disciplinary action against these individuals who uh, you know, may continue after you've educated them, after you've given them you know, maybe uh, some unpaid leave uh, to comply, if they still refuse, then it's up to you to determine, you know, what disciplinary action you take. None of the none of the guidance uh, dictates um, what the results should be, but obviously, that's a problem that the federal government has essentially pushed down to uh, to U.S. federal contractors and just other employers in general. So, with uh, that, um, you know, these are just some examples of accommodations that you might consider. Um, you know, some of the issues to consider, of course, with the testing is, you know, who's going to pay for it. Uh, this falls more into the OSHA ETS side of things. Uh, but with that, just because we're running out of time, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Brian to discuss the uh, OSHA uh, COVID-19 ETS. Thank you. Thank you, Rafino. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll be brief, uh, as brief as possible. I think we're going to go over a few minutes here. Uh, and if you have to sign off, we certainly understand. If you would like to uh, hear the rest of this, if you're not able to uh, stay with us, um, the recording will be available on our website to all participants. So um, by all means, please take advantage of that if uh, your schedule allows. And we apologize. Uh, we want to respect everyone's time here. Um, so OSHA has uh, itself also issued uh, an emergency temporary standard today, uh, the pre-publication um, was released yesterday, but the official uh, effective uh, emergency temporary standard uh, was was actually published today, and it is effective today. Um, it applies to all employers who are regulated by OSHA um, who have at least 100 employees, and I'll discuss briefly uh, how you count uh, or get to who is included within those 100 employees. Um, in short, the uh, ETS requires that employers ensure their employees are either vaccinated or frequently tested and masked if they choose not to get vaccinated. OSHA has uh, put it on employers to decide whether they will allow their employees um, to choose between vaccination uh, and or frequent testing and masking. Uh, in addition to the uh, testing and vaccination requirement, uh, the ETS also rec includes record keeping, reporting and other requirements, particularly the record keeping requirement. I would like to point folks to because that is uh, a requirement that will require some work uh, by covered employers. And you may be asking yourself, OK, I I'm a federal contractor. That's why I uh, signed up for this webinar. What does OSHA have to do with us? And in, uh, I, I want to address that. Uh, and. I'll skip over this, but come back to it. Um, I, I want to cover that real briefly. Um, if you have uh, uh, parts of your uh, operation uh, and employees who are covered by OSHA who aren't engaged in federal contracting, you may also have to comply with, with regard to those employees, uh, the OSHA ETS. So keep that in mind. Um, and it also, the OSHA ETS and its views on testing and what is acceptable for testing uh, they also may inform um, the judgment about what is a reasonable accommodation uh, for those employees who have religious or uh, medical exemptions, or at least claim those exemptions. All right, so getting back to uh, real quick, the uh, 100 employee threshold. Uh, 
This is all of your employees in U.S. locations, uh, regardless of the employee's vaccination status, um, at any time the ETS is in effect. So what that means is if you had 100 employees in January of this year, <clears throat> but you currently only have 50, that would not count. Uh, those, those 100 employees that were uh, prior to the enactment or the effective date of the rule, that wouldn't count. However, if you have 100 employees today, you're covered by the OSHA ETS. Um, and if you drop below that 100 employee threshold at any time during the effective period uh, of the ETS, uh, you will still be covered. So once you qualify, you always qualify. Okay, keep that in mind. Part-time and seasonal employees, they count. Um, independent uh, contractor employees do not count. And staffing agencies at a joint employer uh, or in a joint employer um, work site, the staffing agency counts their employees. You don't count the staffing agency's employees, even though you are contracting with that staffing agency uh, for those individuals. All right. Uh, in addition to the uh, vaccination and uh, uh, testing requirements, uh, you're required, if you're covered, to provide up to four hours of paid time, paid leave, uh, for each primary vaccination dose, so eight hours total, um, a reasonable time and paid sick leave for employees who uh, need to recover from any side effects um, from uh, receiving the vaccines. There was a question that I saw about uh, liability for employers the rule doesn't address liability for employers. I believe that it's fairly limited, but it is something to keep in mind. I think that it is, it, it's, uh, we are unlikely to see employers um, have significant liability for vaccine related requirements. OSHA's uh, rule requires those employees to be vaccinated. Uh, there's a separate um, system for compensating individuals who are uh, um, injured or have a serious side effects. So I, I, I don't worry about uh, employer liability for vaccine side effects. And finally, um, the effective date here is similar to, it's the same as the effective date, the vaccination date uh, for the federal, the safer uh, federal workforce task force guidelines. Um, and that's January 4th. So your employees have uh, uh, until January 4th to get vaccinated or to otherwise comply uh, the testing if that's an option. Um, now, there's the guidance, the OSHA ETS, and there's also the CMS uh, IFR. Um, CMS is the agency that uh, it administers Medicare and Medicaid. They have their own rules that were just issued as well. So if you're a healthcare provider and you accept Medicare and Medicaid, there's a whole nother set of rules or another, another mandate that you'll need to comply with. We're gonna have a separate webinar next week on the CMS rules if you're wondering. In any case, the guidance um, for the Safer Federal Workforce uh, guidance for federal contractors, it is expressly in addition to any other workplace uh, safety requirements, as Michael mentioned, but it, the OSHA ETS does not apply to workplaces covered under the Workforce uh, Task Force um, guidelines. Um, same is true for Medicaid or uh, Medicare. However, again, you may have employees who are currently regulated by OSHA who aren't working on a federal contract or pursuant to a federal contract, so you may have to comply with both. Now, like the federal contractor guidelines, there are pending legal challenges to the OSHA ETS. Unlike the federal contractor guideline challenges, the challenges to the OSHA ETS um, have a much better chance of uh, being successful. Um, it's already been challenged the ETS as of today in the 6th and 11th. I'm sure that there have been others uh, as um, this uh, webinar has, has continued. They're literally rolling in. Um, there are a host of different parties. I think that several different courts of appeals uh, will uh, be engaged and they'll settle on one to actually decide these cases. Um, I don't know where that will be. Uh, it is, I think, helpful to keep in mind, OSHA has promulgated nine uh, emergency temporary standards since 1971. Six have been challenged. OSHA lost five of those cases. So uh, there is a decent chance that one of the challengers or, or one of these challenges will succeed. Uh, we will probably not know that, though, um, for a month or two at best. Uh, 
seems as though I have lost the ability to control uh, the presentation. There we go. All right. Um, and that is, it wraps up, uh, I think, our, we've gone over here, and I appreciate your time, um, but that wraps up my portion of uh, the uh, presentation. Um, Michael, do you have anything to add? Sure, and thank you all. I know we went long, and we throw an awful lot at you. As I, as I warned at the very beginning, we probably could have spent two or three hours on this topic today. And so somehow we all got it in in a little more than an hour. So I appreciate everybody's patience and understanding. Um, just real quick, going through a couple of this, looking at a couple of the questions in the chat box, and we will get to all the, all the, all the questions. As we indicated before, we will try to reach out to you individually uh, to the extent we're able to, to, to address your questions, um, because we do want to get to them all. But a couple of them that popped up that uh, caught my eye. Uh, one question was you know, uh, that, that some of your federal customers and prime contractors are asking for vaccination cards for, for your employees. Do you have to provide them? Uh, my off-the-cuff reaction is no. Uh, there is no contractual obligation to provide the VAX cards to the government. If they wanted that, they would have put that in the contract clause or in the guidance. There's nothing like that for now. Uh, so for the time being, I would say no. Um, you know, perhaps the, the, the customer might be entitled to know about the vaccination status of individuals at the government work site, um, as, as the government certainly has the right to control the safety of its own work site. But uh, beyond that, uh, we can talk about that. Um, another question about you know, asking applicants for proof of vaccination. Should that be pre-application, post-hiring, or after the first day? Uh, at a minimum, it should be after, after hiring. And it's going to be very dependent on the type of position for which they are being hired. Obviously, if it's something that, that they're going to be public facing, uh, that will certainly have certain some considerations. But if they're just going to be squirreled away in an office and you're just making sure that they comply with the, with the federal contractor COVID mandate just to, to check the box, then that would dictate pushing off to an even later time. Uh, last question I'll get to today uh, is, you know, are independent contractors covered by this? Short answer. Yes, if they are truly independent contractors, uh, they are not employees, so you don't you don't control them. They have a contractual relationship, and theoretically, the, the COVID clauses, everything else, should be flowed down to them um, as their own as the, as their own your own subcontractor. Um, as you know, if these, these individuals being working, if they're working side by side with your employees, then they're certainly going to have to comply with the masking and social distancing requirements. And logic would also have it; they would probably also have to comply with the vaccination requirements. So, I say we, we're we're about seven minutes over, and I say there there are over ninety one questions in, in the inbox. I think we got about uh, twenty of them covered here today, and so we will try to reach out to you with uh, with more information. But you know, a final final closing thought from our sponsor here, as they say. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope the information was helpful and to your organization. And just a re reminder, this program has pending approval for legal education hours. To report your hours, please click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. A, a certificate of attendance, including course numbers, will be emailed to you tomorrow, along with a recording of the webcast for watching and sharing. And then be sure to complete our short survey. Uh, we use your feedback to plan future programs that are applicable to your business needs. Thank you for your time today. We greatly appreciate it. This concludes the webinar. Have a great day.